This is Coding Math, episode 37, Verlay Integration, part 2. In the last episode, we started in on Verlay Integration, getting some of the basic concepts down and creating a point object that was a type of particle with physics. The most important thing to remember about this object was that rather than store its velocity, it stores its previous position and calculates its velocity based on its new position minus its old position. Today we'll create stick objects that tie points together and constrain them, and we'll see how what we're doing with velocity is useful. A stick is merely an object that connects two points and has a specific length. The points move according to their individual velocities, gravity, bouncing, friction, and any other forces acting on them. The stick constrains the motion of the two specific points, so they'll always remain a certain distance away from each other. Say this stick is composed of points PA and PB, and has a length of 80. But due to the way each point is moving, it's highly unlikely that after updating the points, they're exactly 80 pixels apart. Let's say that they wind up 100 pixels apart. Well, the stick needs to move them back together by 20 pixels. It will move this one 10 pixels in this direction, and this one 10 pixels in the other direction. Now the stick is happy. Alternately, say the points wound up only 60 pixels apart. Now there are 20 pixels too close. The stick will need to move this one out 10 pixels this way, and this one 10 pixels this way. Again, back to 80, and the world is all right again. Now say PB winds up here. And let's say that its previous position was here, and its position on the frame before that was up here. We subtracted the old position from this position to give us a velocity. And adding that velocity to this position puts us where we are right now. Without the stick interfering, on the next frame we'd get a new velocity like this, and the point would wind up down here. But this stick is going to adjust the point back to here. Now on the next frame we'll subtract the old position from this, giving us a velocity heading off in this direction. So you see that changing the position of the point has effectively altered its velocity, without us ever having to consider velocity itself. So you wind up with a form composed of points and sticks. The points create the form, but the form itself affects the motion of the points. Insert your own philosophical reference about the individual and the group. Okay, time for some code. We'll jump right in exactly where we left off last time. In order to have a stick, we'll need another point. I'll copy and paste the point we have and change its x and y. I'll make its old x and old y the same as its position so it won't have any initial velocity. We can run this now and we see we have two points moving. The new point just falls straight down. Now onto the sticks. We'll make a sticks array first. And then we'll stick a stick in it. A stick is just an object that has two points and a length. So we'll create P0, which is equal to points index 0, and P1, which is points index 1. You could set a length to a hard-coded value like 100, but let's let the position of the points determine the length of the stick. I'll call this function distance and pass in these two points. I shouldn't have to talk much about how this function works. So I've already created it, and I'll just paste it in here. Now we'll need to update the sticks. In the update loop, after update points, we'll call the update sticks function. And now we'll create this function. This will loop through the sticks array and get a reference to each stick. Now let's look at the strategy we'll use for sticks adjusting their points. Back to our picture of a stick. Again, this stick has a length of 80, but the points wind up being 100 pixels apart. So we need to move this one here and this one here. There are all kinds of mathematical strategies you could use for this. You could find the midpoint and use trig and angles to find their corrected locations, or probably any number of other strategies. A decently optimized way of doing this is to get the distance on each axis and the overall distance. If we subtract the distance, 100 in this case, from the stick length, 80, we get a difference of 20. We can then get a percent by dividing that 20 by the overall distance 100. 
then dividing that by 2 because each point will move half of that percent. This gives us the percentage of that distance we need to move each point, 0.1 or 10%. This translates into 0.1 times dx on the x-axis and 0.1 times dy on the y-axis. This gives us an offset x and an offset y that can be added to one point and subtracted from the other point, putting both points in the correct location. OK, back to the code, where we left off in update sticks. We'll get dx, which is p1x minus p0x, and dy, which is p1y minus p0y, and the full distance with math square root. Then we get the difference by subtracting the distance from the stick's length. Realize this could wind up negative if the points are further apart than they should be, or positive if they're too close. That's just what we want. Next we get a percent, which is the difference divided by the actual distance, divided by 2. This is the percent of the distance that each point will have to move to put it at the right spot. Finally we create offset x, which is dx times this percent, and offset y, which is dy times this percent. Now we have the actual amounts on each axis that we need to adjust the points. We then subtract offset x and y from P0's position, and add these to P1's position. And that's it for update sticks. But now that we have sticks, we probably want to see them. So we'll throw in a call to render sticks in update, and then create that function. This begins a path loops through the sticks array, getting a reference to each stick, moves to P0 and does a line to P1. At the end of the loop, it strokes that path. At this point, we're far from done, but we have enough to see if this will work. Well, look at that. It actually looks pretty good. Enough to start maybe adding some more points and sticks to. I'll add two more points, forming a square. And I'll add three more sticks connecting those points. Let's see what this looks like. Well, we have a square, briefly. Then it just kind of folds up on itself. This actually isn't a bug in the code. If you took four actual sticks and somehow attached them at the ends like this, it would pretty much do the same thing. What would you do in the real world? Probably put a cross piece in there to make it more stable. Well, that's exactly what we'll do here. I'll simply add another stick from point 0 to point 1. I'm going to go back in and change the old x on the first point to give the box a bit more spin when it starts out. And look at that, we have a box. And now you can see this bouncing around pretty realistically. You might have noticed something a bit strange, and you might have already logically thought about a problem in the code as it stands. I'm going to move to a specific frame here so that you can see it more clearly. Now here we have two problems. One is that the corner of this box has penetrated the floor, despite us having written code specifically designed to prevent this. The other problem is that the box isn't exactly a square here, it's kind of squashed, like a rubber box. Okay, first of all, let's handle the floor situation. Let's look at a single stick for now. It's up here, and we apply physics to the points, and that pulls it down here. Now, one of these points has gone below the floor, so we move it back up and handle the bounce. Then we update the stick. The points are too close together now, so they get moved apart. But this pushes that bottom point back below the floor again, with no check to correct it. So what we need to do is extract that boundary handling code out of the update points function into a new function called constrain points. This is going to loop through the points array, and we'll have to calculate vx and vy again because we'll need them. But we've already done this physics, so we'll delete that. That's all. Next we'll call constrain points right after we update the sticks. And oops, let's not forget to change the name of that new function. Okay, that handled the floor bouncing. You can slow the video down if you want and check it, but it's fixed. But we still have a bit of springiness going on. How do we fix that? 
Well, let's think about what's happening. We start out with a square, but the physics for each point almost certainly mess that up. So we go through and let the sticks readjust the points. Now we're back to square, right? Not necessarily. Say our first stick here was a, just a little bit too long. We do some minor adjustment there to get two new points. This moves the second stick a bit. Now the second stick is quite long, so it gets more adjustment. But notice that this throws off the first stick. Moving on to the third stick, this gets set right, but it alters the second one somewhat. And the fourth stick changes the third and the first. Now it's tough to tell from a rough sketch like this, but it should be logically obvious that we haven't maintained a perfect square here. But it is better than what we started out with. Eventually we'll arrive at a point of equilibrium where everyone is generally happy. But you can get some warpage before that. To combat that, we just need to accelerate that equilibrium finding process. We can do that by running the update sticks and constrain points function multiple times per frame. This way, after each stick has adjusted itself and messed up the other sticks, and constrained points has done its job, we loop through the sticks again and let them sort themselves out again, and again with constrained points. Each time through, there should be less correction needed, and within a few iterations, you have pretty good stability. Now back in update, I'll just wrap update sticks and constrained points in a for loop that runs three times. Note that you don't want update points in that loop, otherwise velocity, gravity, and any other forces would be applied multiple times per frame. Now it won't be blindingly obvious here, but in more complex situations you'll definitely see more rigidity here. Of course this also means that we're running all that code, looping through all those points, and sticks multiple times. Like everything else in programming, there's a trade-off. Here I've randomized the initial velocity of one of the points, so we get a variety of falls. Here you can see the bounciness with a single iteration. And here I'm running five iterations, a much more solid feel here. Play with it yourself and get a feel for it, and start creating your own forms. In the next episode, we'll look at a few tips and tweaks to make this code even more useful.